It's good to be back in the house. I've been gone for a couple of weeks, uh, actually preaching out in Howell. And then last week, my daughter invited me. She goes to a church out in Fenton, Michigan, and invited me to go there because she was uh, a grad. And, and then they were honoring the graduates that day. I'd never been to the church before in my life. And it was kind of cool to see everybody praying over people without even being asked because they had been going through a four-week series on the kingdom of God and the authority and power that God has put in us. And they were teaching the people that the idea of that you can, with the authority you've received and the power within you, you can pray for the sick and they can be healed. And so at the end of it, they asked everybody that, that was uncomfortable to, 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 if they wanted to leave, to leave. But if they wanted to be prayed for, just stay seated. And if you felt comfortable praying for someone, to stand up. And then as the service wrapped up, as the music was going, those who were standing began to pray with people in the seats. And it's interesting because I've never been to church before in my life and uh, I didn't plan on going. I'd like Elena, I missed the week before. I really don't want to make two week, miss two weeks in a row, but my wife convinced me that my daughter was pretty important. Thank you, Jesus. And so um, I went to the bathroom because I'm old. And then I came back in and I was going to pray for somebody in that back corner on the left. And they'd already left. And I'm like, Lord, did I miss it? And he said, no, there's one. And so I went down an aisle and up an aisle and down an aisle. And I came up to this young lady that had actually been a graduate with my daughter that day on stage. And I asked if she'd been prayed for already, and they said yes. And she said yes, and I said, well, can I ask you what they prayed over you for? And she began to explain to me that she was really hurt by a ministry and a failure of a leader of a ministry. And it was a ministry that my daughter had been a part of that had actually wrecked her as well. And my daughter had been, for six to eight months, been working through this trauma. And so isn't it interesting that the Lord would create a pathway for the one person that might understand what this young lady was going through because it wasn't a ministry that was part connected to that church. And to then connect her to my daughter, who happened to be in the room at the time, and they spent the rest of the day together introducing her to people that are living out a Christian lifestyle, unlike this person in this ministry that had destroyed so many lives. And I just think to myself, for those of us that don't think that our God is a personal God, it's just not true. He will find the one wherever you go. You can't hide from him. He's always desperately trying to find you, to seek you, to create a pathway for you to have the very thing that you needed. With my dad, it was addiction to alcohol. With Pastor Dominic's dad, it was addiction to gambling. Uh, Each and every one of us, he touches in exactly the right way so that we have an opportunity to spend eternity with him because he's a good God that loves us. Tonight's message actually comes out of the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Uh, I've been thinking about this scripture a lot today. It's really transformed just the, the lessons that come out of it have transformed my thinking over the last 10 years or so and really transformed my actions over the last two or three years. So when we began to talk about trans- transformational nights on Wednesday nights and in the month of uh, May, and I had an opportunity to speak, which I just love to do, I began to say, you know, what is it you'd like me to deliver, Lord? And he said, well, what transformed your life? And this is it, just a short teaching on, on something that just wrecked my world and began to bring me into a closer relationship with him and into more effective ministry for him. So it comes out of Matthew 16, chapter 16, verse 13 to 27. I'll read it just because I think the word of God never returns void, right? Um, <clears throat> it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who... Do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say you're John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, But what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, and he said, You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, this understanding that I'm the Messiah, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind in heaven will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in earth. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And from that time on, it says that Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed And on the third day, be raised to life. But Peter took him aside. And he rebuked him. And he said, never, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. The same story is told in both uh, Mark and Luke as well. Mark 8, Luke 9, and Matthew 16. Jesus is obviously coming into this new region, this region of Caesarea Philippi. 
And they ask, he just asked them, who do people think that I am? And you hear what he said, and finally Peter gets the right answer right, and the Lord blesses him. He says, you're blessed, Simon Peter, because nobody revealed that to you but my father. But that's not the part of the story I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about is the twist, the turn in the story. Because one moment Peter's being blessed, and the net called blessed, and the next moment he's being rebuked. And, and I want to just talk a little bit about how that turn happened and what it meant in my life when I began to think about the words that came out of Jesus' mouth. But first I want to focus on verse 26. It says, What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? It's a verse we pass over, isn't it? It's a verse that we just kind of read right by it and we just keep on moving. But it's not a rhetorical question. It literally is, if we think about it, what good would it be to gain the whole world and lose our soul? I mean, I guess if you gain the whole world at four years old or three years old, you might get 80 years of temporal pleasures, and maybe you would you'd have the you know the the billions and billions of of uh, of dollars on earth and the biggest mansion and the prettiest bride and all those fun things. But then you'd spend billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of years in eternity in torment, absent Jesus and the Father. Would that be a good trade? Of course, it wouldn't be a very good trade, right? If we gained the whole world and we lost our soul, that wouldn't be a good trade. And so what trade would you make for gaining just part of the world? Just a mansion or just, just a particular car or anything like that. That, again, would seem to be a crazy trade to make, right? And then I began to think to myself, how did we end up there? Because we're just talking about who Jesus is. And the next thing you know, we're talking about whether or not we should gain the whole world and lose our soul. And I began to take a look at what happened in this scripture. And it all turned in verse 23 when Peter rebukes him. Jesus looks at him and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You have in mind the concerns of God rather than, or you have, you have not in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I like the NASB translation a little better. I read the NIV. The NASB says it this way But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but man's. And I began to think to myself, What does it mean to set your mind on God's purposes versus setting them on man's purposes? And the good news is the verse continues, and and we get to understand what Jesus meant. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple, they've got to do some things. They've got to deny themselves. That's not something we like to do. We kind of like to indulge ourselves, right, and take up their cross. Well, what does that mean? That means you need to be willing to suffer. You didn't take up a cross for no reason. You took up a cross in persecution and suffering. And you need to follow him. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. How upside down is that? Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever would lose their life for my name's sake will find it. And I began to ask myself, what is this thing that Jesus is saying to Peter when he rebukes him? He's, he's basically saying, what is it you're willing to give up for me? And if you think about Peter in particular, after he's raised from the dead, after he's left the grave, after he's appeared in the upper room, after he's had multiple conversations with his disciples, Peter's still out in a boat fishing. Not only did Peter get back in a boat fishing one morning, but he had took six other disciples with him to go fishing. And Jesus comes to the lake shore, and he's cooking some fish on the shore as Peter's out in the boat. And, and we see this mirror image of the calling of Peter where he says, hey, why don't you throw your, your nets on the other side of the boat? And yet, at this moment, they don't know that he's Jesus. And so they throw the nets out, and they catch a crazy amount of fish. And then John realizes it's Jesus. Peter does what Peter does. He hops in the water and comes to shore first. And Jesus has a conversation with Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? More than what? More than the fish, more than the business, more than even these disciples, more than the the sea, more than the business that you used to run with your family called the fishing trade. Do you love me more than these? Then feed my sheep. Well, you know I love you, Lord. Well, do you love me? Then feed my lambs. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And I begin to see that Jesus has to create a pathway for us to understand that he created us, set us apart, and gifted us for particular purposes. And Peter was going back to what he used to be instead of the calling that Christ had set him apart for during his earthly ministry, but really even before that. And I want to get into how our, our callings are just concrete from before the beginning of time. And so as I began to study this scripture and try to get my arms around why Jesus rebuked him so strongly and told him that he was thinking about things from a man's perspective instead of God's perspectives, I began to think about Jesus And this is just such a simple teaching. 
But I began to think about how he was always about the Father's business. The created Jesus, born of a virgin in, in Mary, but perfect in every way, God in the flesh, spent his earthly years, the 33 years or so that he was on this earth, and in particular the, 30, the three or so years that he was in ministry, he spent all of that time doing just one thing. I mean, all of it was to do the Father's will, every bit of it. The healing, so he could demonstrate the Father in power. The, the, the demons being cast out, so he could demonstrate that the kingdom, a new kingdom had come. The destroying of the, the works of the devil, which is what he was called to do, which was the work that the Lord set out for him to do. Eventually, the death on a cross and the resurrection. All of it, so that the Father's will would be done. And I began to think to myself as the created, how crazy it is that I spend most of my life doing my will. And not the Father's will. And I, I don't want to be, yes I do, I want to be challenging today. I want you, to, I want you to, to, to understand that somebody sometimes has to look you right in the eye and punch you in the face. And say that maybe there's something deeper in you than maybe you think there is. And maybe there's more that God has intended for you to accomplish on this earth than maybe you've accomplished so far. And maybe just, just saying nice, gentle and kind things about the love of God, which is really important, isn't going to get you to the place that he wants you to be. And I wish, to be honest with you, that somebody had had this conversation with me a long time ago. Because I was in the church for 38 years, from the time I was 12 and until the time I was 50, without a single leader in the church ever looking me in the eye and saying, do you think that you're accomplishing everything that God intended for you to accomplish? That's the only conversation we're going to have when we stand before him at the judgment seat. What did you do with what I gave you to do and the tools I gave you to do it with? I'm not going to be judged on Lori's job, and I'm not going to be judged on LaDonna's job. I'm simply going to be judged on what he created me for, set me apart for, and gifted me with. And that's it. And it'll either be a great conversation or it'll be something that doesn't go as well as I would like. <laughs> Jeremiah. In the book of Jeremiah, it says that Jeremiah... It, the Lord says that I, before you were even in the womb, I saw you. And I set you apart as a prophet to the nation of Israel. Sometimes when we read those words of amazing, an amazing man of God that did everything that God asked him to do, so many things that Jeremiah went through to accomplish the thing that he was created for, so many times we look at it and go, well, that's kind of cool that he was an amazing man of God, but that isn't my calling. That's not true. It's absolutely not true. Each and every one of us, before we were ever born, before you were a glimmer in mom and dad's eyes, before there was even a sniff of the idea that you would have a name, before any of that, he set you apart, created you, and then set you apart, and then gifted you for per certain purposes and tasks while you're on this earth. And so your call is a different calling than Jeremiah's, but the nature of the call is exactly the same. He created you from before you were ever born. He set you apart for a particular task, and he gifted you with the ability to accomplish that task while you were on this earth. And nobody ever said that to me for 38 years, and I'm not blaming anybody but, my, but myself. But at the end of the day, all the other things that we spend time worshiping, all of them, as Paul says in, Ephes in Acts 5, all of them are no gods at all. Because God's made by human hands. There are no gods at all. Do you remember the stories in the, in the, na the city of Ephesus or the nation of Eph the area of Ephesus? And uh, there's Artemis of the Ephesians, right? This amazing goddess that they, they all worship. And, and Paul's preaching for years in this, period, in this period of time. And as a result, all the silversmiths and all the metal workers and all the woodworkers that are carving this art image of Artemis, they're going out of business because God keeps Paul keeps telling them, God's made by human hands or no gods at all. And eventually they drag him before the court and they want to kill him because he's, he created this pathway for people to believe that human-made gods are no gods at all, right? And I began to ask myself, well, of course it makes sense to us, doesn't it, that created things aren't gods. And for those of us that are sitting in the church, it would seem silly to us to think that a created thing would be a god that we might worship. Now, whether Beyonce or Taylor Swift or the Detroit Lions or the Michigan Wolverines or the Michigan State Spartans or, or something else in your life might be something that you might worship would be a little bit maybe more difficult for us to, to admit that maybe we're, we're not worshiping something when maybe we really are. And so I began to ask myself, what are the things that, that I've been worshiping, Lord? This is a handful of years ago. And he said, the thing that you set, up, set out as more important to me is, is an idol, whatever that looks like. And the thing that I had set out for myself above and beyond what God wanted for me was my own purposes, my own dreams, my own agenda, everything that I wanted to accomplish in my life. And he said, wait a minute, 
that's a, you're worshiping an idol because you're serving someone other than me. You're bowing down to this agenda that you set for yourself, it's, but it's not my agenda for you. It's your agenda for you. It's not my assignment for you. It's your assignments for yourself. And one of the gods that I was worshiping was this idea of success and this idea of, of a particular version of family and this idea of what ministry might look like even. And he said, look, I want you to just do the things that I called you to do. He says, you shall have no other gods before me, whether they're a created object, whether they're another human being, or whether they're your own objectives and goals for yourself. They are, they are gods that I was worshiping. And so I clearly had at least one foot in the world, maybe a little bit more than one foot in the world. And the Bible's pretty clear that we can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, right? He expects us to have everything in the kingdom. And I know you're thinking maybe it's okay to have just a single foot in the world, but remember... We're each of us supposed to become more Christ-like during our lives. We're supposed to, as the sanctifying work that the Lord works in our lives, as he does that, we're supposed to be more about the Father's business, just like Christ was. We're supposed to be demonstrating more of the Son's power, just like Christ did. We're supposed to be exhibiting more of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus did. His commands mean something to us, and we follow them. His love for lost humanity becomes our loss, a love for lost humanity. His desire to write injustice becomes our desire to write injustice. But having one foot in the world results in a break of a covenantal relationship with the Lord. Our part of the covenant is that we're to lose our life for his name's sake. That's our part of the covenant. His part of the covenant is salvation and sanctification and is directing and preserving and protecting and guiding us into the purposes for which we were created and set apart. So even a pinky toe in the world is an obstacle to this covenantal relationship that we have between the father and, the, and his children. And the Bible is very clear on Matthew 6. It says you cannot serve two masters. It's impossible to do it. And I was trying to do it for a long period of time. Maybe some of you feel the same way that I do back then. And, and obviously I'm still not exactly where I would like to be. But Paul helps us understand what it looks like when people serve two masters. In 2 Timothy, he says this, he says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. And as you read that scripture, you say to yourself, well, that's an amazing description of America today. All those sinners out there all around the place, that's exactly what they look like. But he's not talking about the sinners in this chapter of the book of 2 Timothy. He's talking about the church. He's speaking to the people in the church and saying this is what the church is going to look like. It is what the church begins to look like when we allow the people in the church, when we allow ourselves to have a toe, a foot, one leg, half our body in the world when he wants all of all of us. How do I know he's speaking about the people in the church? Because the scripture goes on and it says they, these lovers of self and money and boastful, proud, ungrateful, abusive, lovers of self, are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. They're loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. Not only is he describing the church people, he's describing the leaders in the church, the teachers of the people of God, who are boastful and proud and abusive and disobedient and ungrateful and unholy and without love and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of self. How do we end up in that situation where he calls them men of depraved minds? How do we get there? It's a lot easier than you think to just consistently allow part of you to be grabbing a hold of something that's not something that God wants you to be grabbing a hold of. And it will lure you in and suck you in. There are things that the Bible says we're to flee from because we can't handle the temptation. And I'm not trying to scare anybody to death, but when we play church instead of loving God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength, it can become a tragic thing. We've seen powerful men and women of God just in the, the most recent period of time that have fallen from grace. Robbie Zacharias, Carl Lentz, maybe Mike Bickle. So many people that we thought had it right that were lured by something in the world that ate their ministries up and destroyed other people's lives. I've seen it in my daughter in a ministry that she was connected to on a very small scale even here locally. Never, ever underestimate the draw of the world. 
It's so easy to get pulled inside, and, and the key to never letting that happen is really just simple, and that's all I want to share with you tonight. You need to be intentional about doing the Father's will for your life rather than your own. The Bible says that we're to imitate Christ. And I know when I talk about having a single foot in the world, it's like, well, nobody can ever get that right. Well, Jesus did. He says, I've come down from heaven not to do my will in John 6, but to do the will of him who sent me. And I know it seems pretty basic, but this realization that our Lord and Savior, Jesus, lived his life devoted to a will that was not his own, but instead the Father's, the, the King of kings and Lord of lords, he who was going to judge the living and the dead, lived a life as a human being about a single thing, somebody else's agenda versus his own. And if he would demonstrate that, and the Bible consistently shows us that we're to demonstrate and follow and imitate who he is, then maybe we should do exactly the same thing, doing the Father's will. Shouldn't every person who calls themselves a Christian, who attaches the name Christ to themselves, shouldn't we take the time to understand that he was all about the Father's business and we should do the same? Shouldn't one of the costs of our faith be to set aside our own desires and our goals and our dreams and our, even our will in order that his will would be done through us? I mean, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, as the cup of the wrath of God, the fury of the cup of the wrath of God is ready to, about to be poured upon him, and he looks up to the Father and he says, if it's possible, if you could take this particular assignment from me, that'd be cool. I would, I would, I would, take, I would accept that as a, as a gift from you. But if not, what? Your will be done, not my will be done. Later on in John 4, he says, my food, when he's talking to the disciples, he's been talking to the woman at the, at the well, right, the Samaritan at the well, and the disciples go out to get some food, and they come back, and they're like, Jesus, do you want something? And he's like, no, I'm good. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And they're like, did somebody go get him some food? What, what, what happened while we were gone? But his point was simply, he didn't need another kind of nourishment. He just needed to be about his father's business. And there are a couple of scriptures that just present who Christ was, this relentless pursuit of the Father's will, and that's only three or four of them. But just understand that if you take the time to read it, you can see that he was all about the Father's will. And so if we come all the way back to the scripture that I read at the beginning today, and he's, Peter's been, been called blessed because he's realized that Jesus is the Messiah through a revelation of the Father, and then the next thing you know, he's rebuking Jesus because Jesus is saying that he's going to have to suffer and die at the hands of the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and eventually he's going to raise on the third day. And he has to rebuke him and say, Peter, get behind me because you're acting like Satan right now. You're a stumbling block to me because you're not setting your mind on God's purposes but men's. And I began to ask myself, am I setting my sights on God's purposes or men's? About 10 years ago, uh, not long after I came together with this church. And I began to think about Matthew chapter 7. In my mind, the scariest of all scriptures where it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. But not, but only the one who what? Only the one who what? Does the will of my Father in heaven. That's the bar. Our, our objective in life is to live a life that does the will of the Father, and our eternal security rests upon whether or not we get that right. Christianity isn't a religion. It's a call to serve the Most High King. Christianity isn't a part-time thing. It's a full-time commitment to doing the will of the one who created us. Christianity, it isn't a hobby or a side job. It's a high calling to serve God and chase after his unique will for our lives every minute, every hour, every day, every year, year after year after year after year until he takes us home. In other words, you were created on purpose, with purpose, for a purpose. Or as we say it in the school of ministry, you, just like the prophet Jeremiah, were created, set apart, and gifted for specific purposes. And you are amazing at it. Amazing at it. Because he's gifted you with it, created you for it, set you apart for it. You're a 12 out of 10 at the thing that he's created you for, literally. Because you have a supernatural power inside of you that's gifted you to achieve his purposes on this earth. Your purpose is different than Jeremiah's. Your calling is different than Jeremiah's. Maybe you're an evangelist. Maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you're called to hospitality. Maybe you're called to mercy. Maybe you're a missionary. Maybe you're a preacher. Maybe you're a pastor. Whatever that might look like, it's a different calling than Jeremiah's. But it is no less important to his attempt and effort to redeem a holy people unto himself. Do you know he's been working since the beginning of time to create a pathway for a remnant to be reconciled to him, those that would trust in the, the sending of his son and believe on who he was? It is, it's most of us aren't willing to give up everything 
to give up self in order to achieve the purposes he gave up. So the only thing different between Jeremiah and us sometimes is that we don't accept the calling or we do accept it, but we don't chase after it like Jeremiah did. And if you're convicted a little bit by the conversation today, I can relate because I was convicted by the Holy Spirit on a plane 10 years ago, and I'm not going to get into that story. But after 38 years of doing 10%, 20%, 50% of what it is that the Lord wanted to do, had created me for and set me apart for uh, in my ministry, I'm not proud of the fact that for 38 years I was chasing after a little bit of the Holy Spirit, sometimes a lot of the Holy Spirit, but never all of the Holy Spirit. All of us are capable of doing more for the kingdom. All, of, all we have to do is be more about the Father's will and less about our own. And I know that's a simple sentence, but it's hard to live out, isn't it? It's hard to live out this idea that we need to be more about his business and less about our own. But let me say it this way. He's not really all that interested in part of parts of you. He's not really all that interested in parts of most of you. He's not interested in all of part of you or all of one part of you. He simply wants all of all of you surrendered to him. You notice I said as I began to, as I began to live out more of a, a serious agenda for the Lord, every part of my life became more beautiful. Let me be honest with you. It became more meaningful. It became more fruitful for the kingdom. You notice I didn't say that as I began to try and live out a life that was more consistent with what he asked for, that life got easier. It didn't. That life got less stressful. It didn't. That life was more comfortable. It wasn't. Or that I now stand in a position of greater blessing. In fact, I have way less today than I had when this all began. But life makes sense to me now. Does that make sense? It's really uncomfortable sometimes, the places that God puts me. Frequently, life gets pretty complex. Before I walked here today, I was struggling to find time to make sure this message was ready because I was talking about a huge kingdom ministry project in Tennessee in the, music, in the Christian music industry, followed by a conversation with about eight or nine people for the Peru trip that we're taking in September. And I'm like, Lord, how am I going to get my day job done? And how am I going to make sure that I don't embarrass you when I speak at Oakland Church this evening? And he's like, it's okay, I've got it. It's okay, I've got it, because you're chasing after the things that I've set, apart, set you apart for. I've never felt more alive than I did since I started putting myself aside and his will for my life at the front. And I'm here to tell you that you can find greater purpose by getting into your purpose too. It's transformational. It's simply transformational to begin to get deeper into the things that he's asked you to do. You can find rest in the uncomfortable. You can find joy in the struggle. You can firm your calling in the persecution. All you have to do is set your mind on the Father's will for your life. Every day, intentionally saying to the Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Just watch what happens when you step up. Watch what happens when you step in to the purpose for which you were created, set apart, and gifted. I'm confident that as you spend more time on his will and less time on your will, gradually your will not only shrinks into the background, it actually gets distasteful. I don't know if you understand that, but as you begin to, to just in, soak yourself in his will for your life, you see how beautiful it is, how perfect it is, how desirous it is, and the things that you, that you thought were the things that were important just aren't all that important anymore. As a simple little teaching in the, in the Old Testament, the word holy, the hundreds and hundreds of times that it's used, 80% of the time, the time the word holy is used is kodesh in the Hebrew. And kodesh doesn't mean pious. It doesn't mean perfect. It means set apart. And so when Moses is standing there and the bush is burning and the, and the Lord says to him, take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground, he says, take off your sandals because this ground has been set apart for me. When, when they're actually receiving the manna and on the sixth day they're like gather up twice as much because the Sabbath is holy, it's Kodesh. It's because it's been set apart for the Lord. So let me free you of something today. If you can consider holiness your pursuit, think of it not as being perfect. Think of it as setting yourself apart for his purposes in your life. If you do that, the more you do it, the more you begin to be attracted to the, the things that he is and the less you're attracted to the things that, he, that you shouldn't be doing anyway. And in fact, the more you seek him and set your apart, yourself apart for him, the less time you have to do the stupid things that you do and I do every single day. Does that make sense? If you begin to be faithful with what you have, he's going to do more and more and more. That's what I've seen in my life. I really thought for 35 years in the church, and I was a pretty serious Christian according to most people, but I know what is in me now. And I know that I could have done so much more. But for 35 years in the church, I thought I was a giver. But when I finally began to give him all of that part of me, everything in the bank, 
he began to release ministries and gifts out of me that I didn't even know I had. The idea of being a director and a founder and a teacher in a school is insane. Would have never even thought of it. The idea of being a preacher, the idea of taking teens to foreign nations and, and leading them in ministry is insane to me. But it's not insane to him. Because he takes every single time we give him a little bit of ourselves, he's faithful to multiply it and hand us more. And the next time that we have a little bit more, if we're faithful to step out in the courage and step out in the uncomfortable and step out into the insanity that it is that he's asked us to step into, the more he will release in you more giftedness. My life has literally been transformed by a very simple thing, which is that I want to be about his business and not my own. There was first a mindset that had to change. But once my mindset changed, the next thing you have to do is have your feet get in the game, right? We have to take a step into that calling. We have to take a step into that uncomfortableness. Most everything about everything that God has put into me has become available as a weapon to fight kingdom battles because I was comfortable eventually stepping into the uncomfortable. My default answer for Christian ministry is simply yes. When people come to me and say, well, you know, what it is that I'm supposed to be connected to? What is it that I'm supposed to do? Say yes. Just say yes. If you've never been on a mission trip before and you want to think about it, going on a mission trip, say yes. The only time you shouldn't say yes is when the Holy Spirit does what he did to Paul and says, I was kept by the Holy Spirit from coming to you in Asia. If you get that clear a message from the Holy Spirit not to go, don't go. But don't let money keep you from going. Don't let some other party you're going on back here keep you from going. Just trust that if you step into this Christian ministry, everything about your life is going to change. And it wasn't until I began to do that with my life that I began to feel really alive. Never, ever forget, Christians. First Corinthians 6 says that you are not your own. You were bought with a price. And that was a pretty precious price. The most perfect of lamb sacrificed on the cross for you and for me. The price that he paid is deserving of all of all of you. That price is all of all of me. Surrender to the Father's will is good and pleasing and perfect will. And his will for your life is, to, is unique to your life. Remember that. Your calling is not my calling. His call on your life is not my call. But we're all called to live a life dedicated to his agenda, not to our agenda. We're all called to live a life focused on his purposes, not our purposes. Doing so matters, as I wrap up, doing so matters, if the, if the worship team is probably going to come back up and close things out tonight, Pastor, I think. But doing so matters, living a life for him matters eternally. Let me just read to you the end of the age from Revelation chapter 12. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They, you know this scripture. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. How many of you have always ended there with that scripture? How many of you remember it exactly as I just wrote it? They overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. But there's one more thing that comes afterwards. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink, shrink from death. Death to self, death to our own agendas is where we find a life that really matters. As Matthew 16 says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life from me will find it. You may not have to die physically, but you have to die to self. We have to die to self. It's an eternal truth that if we die to self, people end up in heaven. Let me say it again. <laughs> How many of you have loved ones that don't know Jesus? How many of you have friends that don't know Jesus? How many of you have colleagues that don't know Jesus? How many of you have people in this church that don't know Jesus? Each and every one of them's eternal security is dependent on you and me dying to ourselves so that they can understand who he is and what he did for you. Are you ready to die for yourself? Are you ready to die to self? It's easy and it's hard all at the same time. So if you all just bow your heads with me for just a moment as I, I just ask the Lord to just fall in this place with the Spirit. Heavenly Father, we just, Lord, we understand that it's a simple sentence, but it's that it's hard to do in reality, Lord. We just want to die to our own agendas, Lord. 
That doesn't mean that we don't want to be good husbands and fathers and brothers and sisters and, and watchers over our family and good colleagues and good workers. But it does mean, Lord, that the things that are not of an eternal significance, that aren't part of the things that you've asked us to do in this world um, as a family, that those things aren't nearly as important as us getting into the game and touching people with a kingdom message, writing injustice and proclaiming the excellencies of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Lord, may me manifest the sweet aroma of the knowledge of you in every place. As Jonathan said this weekend, Lord, may every room we step into, because we've been committed to your will, may it get better. May the elevator that we walk into just smell like a sweet aroma of the knowledge of you. That means that the knowledge of you means we get to proclaim you, Lord Jesus. May may the bedroom that we step into, the kitchen that we step into, the, the, the theme park that we're standing in, wherever we go, Lord Jesus, may a dedicated, sold out, not our own agenda, Christian, change the lives of everybody that we encounter, Lord. Lord, may we stand before you one day as the, as the sheep are being lined up and the goats are being lined up, Lord. May we see nobody we know in the line with the goats. May everybody that you give us to, cert, to, 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 to touch, to, to impact, to reach with what you've created us for and set us apart for, may each and every one of them come to the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus so that we don't have to look at them. And Lord Jesus, please don't ever let this happen. Don't let them end up in hell and look back at us and say, why didn't you ever tell me? Why is it that you never told me what it was that, that, that I could have had and the thing that I'm not gonna have going forward? We just trust you, Father, that these words are not negative words to anybody here today, maybe convicting words, but your words bring life, Lord. I know for me, after 38 years, Lord, of getting it wrong, the fact that I talk about it today as passionately as I do, isn't because it's frozen me, but because it's motivated me, Lord. And so I would ask for your Holy Spirit to convict, your Holy Spirit to encourage, your Holy Spirit to, to give us a swift kick in the pants sometimes, Lord, and get us up out of our seats and into the game for the thing you called us for. For those, Lord Jesus, that, that don't really understand how important they are to your plan, Lord, give them a fresh encounter with you. Give them a fresh encounter and an understanding of how personally interested you are and having them be a part of your salvation story for somebody in their life, for some ones in their life, maybe for people in the foreign mission field, Lord, because every single one of them was created, set apart, and gifted for certain works. And Lord, as a church, for those that are sitting here that are, that are so serious about their faith, they come on Wednesday nights and they're coming on Sundays and they're running community groups. And Lord, just help us to be an encouragement to others in this body, to help them understand how beautiful and magnificent your plan for their lives is, Lord and how life surrendered to you is the best kind of life. That as we, as we give up ourselves, Lord Jesus, we actually become enslaved to you and that's a good thing. And Father, we trust you. We trust you with what you're gonna do with these words. We trust you with what you're gonna do with these words for the people in the house, for the people they're gonna share it with in the future, for the people online. Lord, we love you so much and we thank you that your word never returns void. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed today's message and you want more coming your way, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or our podcast. We'll notify you of great messages and great content we'd love to send you. Yeah, I'd love to meet you in person at what, 9 a.m. service or 11 a.m. service. Have the best week of your life. We'll see you soon.